Welcome to study number one based on my song, God Over Ball. Today we're going to talk about what the Bible says about idolatry and how that can relate to basketball and other sports. To pay my penalty with his blood, that's precious. Now I go free in his love, that's the message. How could I ever return to worship an idol that will ever be burned and never discerns and makes me learn. The number one commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. So when we love anything with our hearts and lives more than God, that's what the Bible calls idolatry or idol worship. If we put a person, a thing, money, a sport, social media, or anything on a higher pedestal, pedestal in our lives than God, then we've traded in the eternal, all-powerful, perfect, personal God who created everything for something that's temporary and fleeting, something that wasn't meant to be in that position in our hearts. Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible about idolatry as it gives such a stark contrast between God and idols. I definitely recommend reading it on your own as I won't read the whole passage here in this video, but I will highlight a few of the points that are made in these verses. Let's talk about how it describes idols. In verses 3 through 5, it says, For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They can't speak. They have to be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil nor can they do good. So obviously this was a particular context and was talking about a specific type of idol worship going on where people would take wood and craft it, decorate it, and actually bow down and worship it and fear it as a god. But this passage shows us at least 10 characteristics of idols and 10 characteristics of God. So we'll look at them side by side to compare and contrast God with idols. Starting with idols, number one, the wood was cut from the forest, meaning it was something that was created. Number two, it was the work of the hands of the workmen, meaning man had a part in making it as well, so it was man-made. Number three, they decorate it with silver and gold, meaning it looks awesome in some way and is appealing to the eye, right? It's visually appealing. Number four, they fasten it with nails and hammers so it won't topple, and it has to be carried, meaning it can't stand or move on its own, so it needs help. Number five, it cannot speak and it cannot actually tell you anything or give you any guidance, so idols are mute. Number six, do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil or good, and that meant that it's literally lifeless. It's an inanimate thing that can't actually help you or harm you, so it's not worthy of fear. Number seven, later on in this section of Jeremiah, it also says that idols will perish, meaning they're temporary. Number eight, it also adds that they are without knowledge. Number nine, without breath. And number 10, that molded images are a falsehood, meaning they're a false god. So here we have 10 characteristics of an idol in the left-hand column. And so let's compare how the passage describes God and we'll put his characteristics in the right-hand column. It says he's the maker of all things. In other words, he's uncreated. Literally, he made all things, including man. So he made man as opposed to being man-made. Also, there is no one like him, meaning he's the almighty God who is unfathomable, invisible, and needs no help. Also, the text talks about when God God speaks, he speaks powerfully. It also mentions how everyone should fear God as he's the only one who can actually pour out wrath and judgment on people, so he should be feared. Additionally, the text says that he is the everlasting king, meaning he's eternal. And next, it says that he is full of wisdom, so he's all wise. As we talked about earlier, he created all things and he literally gave breath to everyone and everything that has breath. And lastly, the passage says, the Lord is the true God. So when we look at the contrast, it's amazing and we see that these characters Characteristics of an idol can apply to many things today, including basketball, entertainment, or sports, right? Basketball was made from created materials. It was man-made. It's visually appealing. I mean, think about all the cameras, TVs, stadiums, and videos, all for basketball or other sports, right? To be amazed at when we watch and look at it. Basketball needs help, and also sports need help, right? They can't do anything on their own without people. It itself cannot talk to you or give you guidance. It's not worthy of fear because it can't do good or evil. It's temporary. It does not have knowledge itself. The ball has air in it, but it doesn't have breath. So ultimately, it can become an idol if you think it's life, if you think it's more important than the one true God. There's a line in my song that really captures the essence of this whole topic, which is, our rock was the ball that we could handle, but now I'm not worthy to loose my rock, his sandal. See, I used to worship something that I could control, that I could pick up and put down. Now I worship the one true rock, who is the one in control of all things, 
things and who created everyone. On my own, I'm not even worthy to undo the strap of his sandal. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying basketball or other sports are bad in themselves and that we shouldn't watch them or play them, but if we devote ourselves to them over God, then it's an idol. It's idol worship. Well, that's it for this study on idolatry. I'll see you in my next video related to God over ball. Talk to you then. See, I rock was the ball that we can handle. Now I'm not worried to lose my rocket sandal. Ball of a God was the deepest scandal. Now it's kind of a ball on all the TV channels. My triple that was shooting dribble pass.